Good evening. Welcome to the British Library. My name's John. I look after the events programme here at the library and it's been my absolute pleasure to work on a programme for our fantastic exhibition, Fantasy Realms of Imagination. I still get excited by that music. We've only got a week to go of the exhibition, so if you've not seen it yet, or you know people who might like to, it's running only until this coming Sunday. Uh, it's had already 50,000 visitors and it's one of the most successful exhibitions here of all time. So it's been a brilliant programme. We've had amazing authors. We've had Neil Gaiman here. We've had Rebecca Kwong here, we've had Tamsin Muir here, we've had, you know, so many of the greats of fantasy fiction. Um, the exhibition is packed full of some of them, also their you know, predecessors going all the way back to the original Beowulf manuscript, Alice in Wonderland manuscript, we've got original Angela Carter, Ursula K. Le Guin, the list goes on and on, and through costumes, through films, through images, it's just uh, a rich treasure trove, and I hope those of you who've seen it have enjoyed it. So tonight we have a great event for you, we have the incredible Olivia Blake, who's uh, on a trip over from the USA. She'll be with uh, the equally fantastic Elizabeth May, and they'll be in conversation with Lucy Holland. Uh, afterwards, we've got a bookstall outside. Those of you watching online, um, good to see you here as well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we, you can also buy books by visiting the Books tab at the top of your screen. You can also ask questions to the, uh, to the, to the authors later on, um, either here in the room, just put your hand up and wait for the microphone, or if you're watching online, you can put in a question in the form below the video window and we will read out some of those, the best ones, uh, and as we go on later on. So not much more to add, but just to briefly to introduce our, our, our chair for tonight, Lucy Holland. She is the uh, ex-bookseller, it says here, and the host of the award-winning feminist podcast, Breaking the Glass Slipper, which is such a cool title. Uh, her new uh, novel, or oh, forthcoming, I think still forthcoming, is A Song of the Huntress, and that's a follow-up to uh, the sending a sister song and she will introduce our other guest to you. So please welcome to the stage Olivia Blake, Elizabeth May and Lucy Holland. <laughs> Confused. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need you to get the therapy invoices. <laughs> I have them in a pile. I'm like, I'm in the middle, and it just feels weird to Sorry. like <laughs> to be in the middle of the spotlight right there. <laughs> wow, it's so amazing to see so many of you tonight. This is so lovely, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, I, I am Lucy Holland. Uh, I am the author of Sister Song, the upcoming, it is indeed upcoming, Song of the Huntress, which is out from Pan Macmillan next month. I've read it, it's great. It's very transportive. Thank you very much. I should, yeah, yeah I should get you to my cheerleading from now on. <laughs> um, I am one third of the intersectional feminist podcast Breaking the Glass Slipper, which has been running since 2016. So if you're into podcasts, do check that out. We've just launched a new season. Um, and I'm going to hand over to my fantastic uh, authors here who are going to hopefully entertain you tonight all about dark fantasy. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, um, I'm Elizabeth May, and I'm the author of the of To Cage a God, which comes out tomorrow, and that is... Oh, congratulations! Oh, yes, thank I you! Know. Well, <laughs> it just came out tomorrow! I said, well, I've read it, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it is about a two sisters trying to defeat a royal family that um, has dragon gods caged to their bones. It has one of my favorite things, too, which is second chance romance. Mm -hmm. That's one of my problematic loves, but yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> it's great. Big second chance romance fan. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's great. It's juicy. <laughs> You'll love it. I'm Olivia Blake. Um, I like pina coladas and getting caught in the rain. Uh, <laughs> I'm not Neil Gaiman. <laughs> um, I wrote the Atlas trilogy. Um, I'm sorry, I guess. I, I'm not that sorry is the problem. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, let's go. Let's talk. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So the title of this event is Dark Fantasy. And fantasy has so many subgenres. So I wanted to start by asking, what do we mean by this one? Because when I started out in book selling about 12 or 13 years ago now, Dark fantasy had its own shelf. It, it very much meant urban fantasy. You know, we had authors like um, Sherilyn Kenyon, Charlene Harris, writing about vampires, werewolves, supernatural entities, mostly in a contemporary setting. But, you know, since then, obviously, that was a long time ago. We've evolved. The, the, the term itself has evolved. Um, we have dark academia now, for instance, which yes. is its own subgenre. So 
firstly, what does the term dark fantasy mean to you? And would you use it to describe your books? I actually, I would have gone the other way. If you were to ask me, what do you think dark fantasy is? I would have guessed second worlds. Like, okay, so I come from fandom, and I think of dark fantasy as like, if it were, if it had an AO3 tag, it would be like a, like a war AU. Like that to me is dark fantasy. Like yours was like, like very cut and dry, like that's a dark fantasy from purely fandom rules, which is why I don't see my book as a dark fantasy, so I could leave if you want. That's <laughs> <laughs> I'll <just> say, say. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's just like with, with me, I come from like the romance community, so it's like dark romance has a very You're right, and that's different a totally vibe. different thing, yeah. <laughs> Where like the dark describes the, like, the romance, and um, so, so when people are talking about mine as dark fantasy romance, I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> there are so many confusing layers now that you mention that, yeah. So now, it, so, so we've determined it's a meaningless term. Yes, sorry. <laughs> well, at least we can all stay. Oh, but I do remember, I do remember the, uh, the times that you were talking about, and there was like an entire like, like phase where there was like vampire romance shelves. Yes. And I was like, oh, this makes it so easy for me to find vampires. And then they were like, you know what, we're gonna do away with that. Yep. Well, I like to talk about this because, so my book, Masters of Death, uh, I originally self-published it. And when I started to query it in 2017, Agent said, if it has the word vampire in it, it will be deleted unread. Yes. And I like to point out, so publishing is on like, as, from my observation, publishing is on like a five-year cycle trend. It's, it's, it's similar to real estate. Real estate and um, publishing trends, five years. Yes, Masters of Death, which um, has now, is now... Uh, beloved institutionally by the institution of publishing. So vampires are back, baby. Um, <laughs> yeah. They were gone for so long. Like, um, when I went... Well, they were done, you know, we yeah. were just oversaturated. There were too, there many, were too many vampires. So when I came out with my debut, which is actually a fey book, the, it was like literally, the, they're vampires, but it was the only way that I could get away with writing vampires was just by like, no, they're fey. Yeah. See, they're different. Yeah, yeah. no, no, exactly. <laughs> I'm not like other vampires. And that was the vibe I was trying to put out, and it wasn't working. Yeah. I will. So, um, so dark, and, and I, I have this question about dark academia as well, because that's another one. Right. I did an event with ML Rio recently, and we were both like, let's try and figure out what dark academia even means. Because when we came out with our books, they, we neither of us was thinking of them as dark academia. And one of the, what I think is an interesting question is, why does dark academia involve murder specifically? And um, I think we, we I, I, don't, I forget where we landed. This event was very crazy because we were in this sort of tiny, very intimate community center. Is that me? Am I making noise? No, no. Oh, oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> they warned me this might happen. I'm like, I'm like, wait, what is that noise? Oh, that's my necklace. We were in this tiny community center just talking about like, why do you think it's murder? And I was like, I think from an industry standpoint, it's because the other crimes require more like warnings. You get like, cause you can, there's such a thing as justifiable murder, right? There's justifiable homicide and, and you can get a reader to buy into murder and still like someone can be a murderer and still be an acceptable person morally. But a lot of the other crimes like, no, <laughs> she's like, she's like, no. <laughs> anyway, we talked and I was like, wait, what time is it? And someone was like, you've been talking for 90 minutes. <laughs> Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, and it, it is funny this this dark descriptor um, because it because it <laughs> I like it. <laughs> it's really contributing to the ambiance, <laughs> the chaotic ambiance. It's like a like a like a crack of thunder, sort of like oh no, death is coming for us. Someone will be eliminated before the night is over. Um, you okay. know what I kept thinking like dark academia was because yes. I, I had like not yes, tell known me. much about it. it Explain was, it to me. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> so have you ever seen the like B movie with Joshua Jackson about like secret societies at like Yale? It, I, okay, I swear to that, God, that isn't you. Is it? Is it? Is it you? Is it me? <laughs> anyway, I'm just so kidding. It's just, I'm <laughs> So it's, and it's called the skulls. Okay, and there's the skulls. like there's like murder in it, yeah. and and weird like like Yale secret societies. Right. Sort of, it's a terrible movie, but I loved it because Joshua Jackson wasn't it. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, and who doesn't love a cult tale? Yeah. 
<laughs> we'll have a good ritual sacrifice and cult in underground cults that uh, are, you know, rich people. A child told me a great joke that I hope I can recall now that he that he wrote Escape. himself that he authored, and it was something it was something about what do you call a cult water? The answer was sacrificial dam. <laughs> and it had to do with a waterway. You can imagine it. It was really good. Oh. Well, now that you've completely shredded my first question. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Shall we, we try and home in a little bit about what we, what we might, you know, the kinds of things we might find in dark fantasy yes. books. So I want to ask you whether Let's you think... Storm. Dark. It starts with character or world, because... Both of you tackle fairly heavy themes in your books. I mean, in high stakes environments, we've got like the battle royale arena of competitive academia and the unstable politics of revolution. And considering we're all shaped by our environments, does the setting come first or the character? You know, what kinds of people emerge from such stressful and turbulent environments? You go. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so for me, everything is always character first. I think what I love most in a book and, and what I spend the most time on is developing voice and characterization. And the world is, um, like, to me, the Atlas series is psychological thriller with a speculative background. And, and because, you know, it, I, I have... I wanted to play with the idea of like, what if we just solved climate change? Would that solve everything? What if we had limitless access to knowledge? What if we had access to as much power as a person could have? Um, would that actually change the way that we exist in the world? Would it change anything about us um, and, and how we behave and what our morality is? Mm -hmm. And to me, this is a series that's definitely about ethics and I guess it, like, <sighs> I guess I don't think of it as dark because the world is very grounded. Um, I think that's why it's hard to, I mean, I certainly wouldn't look at the contemporary world and be like, this is uplifting. <laughs> this is an upbeat situation, a real cozy, <laughs> real cozy place. But, um, but I think the fact that it is, it is, the tactility of the world is so similar to our world. It, even if it's dark thematically, I don't necessarily jump to the dark descriptor because it's still supposed mm -hmm. to feel like we're kind of here. We're in a world that looks and feels like ours. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, it definitely starts with the characters as well um, because, you know, I think one of the things that I wanted to explore in To Cage a God was um, basically good people doing bad things um, to further, further what they perceive to be, like, good goals. And so it's just like, you know, if you are, say, undercover in the palace and, um, you know, you are supposed to be playing a part and the queen orders you to murder people, can you refuse um, and, and risk your entire mission? And so, um, so all of my characters end up doing um, fairly dark things and a lot of murder <laughs> and um you know and I, and I kind of feel like that's one of the things that sets dark fantasy apart is that the dark can 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 be something that describes what characters are are going through they go through very very dark moments where they begin to doubt whether or not they are um whether they are a good person whether their their mission is 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 something that is is beneficial um, and it, it creates a kind of, um, you know, complex quandaries, which I really like. I like morally gray characters. I like characters who go through that kind of complexity and, and realizing like how far they get to be pushed and what they're, what they will do when they are pushed that far. Do you know what? Instead of shredding my questions, you have brought us beautifully onto my next question. You're welcome. Yes. Beautifully. <laughs> which is about moral ambiguity. I can't even say the word. Moral ambiguity. Olivia, I know you've discussed this before in mm. interviews. You know, the, the idea of characters coming up against the impossibility of doing the right thing. Yes. Um, and obviously, Elizabeth, you've just spoken about characters, you know, who obviously don't shy away from doing things that, you know, we may find morally reprehensible in some situations. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what I want to know is, you know, how much of our desire, because I think this is, we, there is a desire um, amongst readers, consumers of media, to see more morally grey characters, um, or anti-heroes, or even full-blown villains these mm -hmm. days. I mean, how much of that is a desire, uh, you know, to see 
well, how much of it is a response, basically, to, to come away from the tropes of classic fantasy? I mean, I was just in the exhibition, a wonderful exhibition, um, and one of the posters said, you know, oh, heroes haven't always been shining knight types. They've been, you know, they are fallible people. But mm -hmm. being a fallible person is not the same thing as being an anti-hero or mm -hmm. a deliberately morally grey character. So where do you think this, this quite modern desire to see these people comes from? Um, so I was actually, there's an amazing article about this written by uh, Jennifer Lynn Barnes, who is, um, who's the author of like the Hawthorne, um, the Hawthorne Brothers, um, that sort of thing. She is a psychologist um, am, who specializes in, in fiction and like the psychology of fiction. And she did this entire amazing article on why people like love villains. And um, it was really interesting to me to read uh, about, you know, how, uh, like villains are essentially a very safe space to explore moral complexity and um, you know in difficult choices and um, you know in, in people doing bad things for for what they think to be the right reasons. Um, personally, I love a villain romance. <laughs> it is a, it is not for everybody, but I love a villain romance because I just I think it's really interesting to explore that kind of that kind of dynamic where you have you know you have your main character who is interacting with this this you know this dark other character like Alina in the Darkling um, you know it, they bring out another darker aspect of the main character which I think is always is, is always an interesting and um, a complex dynamic I love I love doing those so. I always love to defend enemies to lovers because I think what's what's appealing about it is the idea that this person really respects you. Mm -hmm. That there's there's something about like well, and it has to be true enemies to lovers. Like I won't get into this too much, but like that you have to be enemies in the sense that you both can't be alive. You know? Yeah, it has you're to be not your, just your equal on on the battlefield. Yeah, it has to be your equal yeah. on the battlefield. Well, otherwise yeah. it's rivals to lovers. It's a different right, trope. right, right, right. Okay, rivals mm -hmm. to lovers is, is always confused with enemies to lovers, and I'm it like, is, if they're not enemies. ready to like murder each other, yeah, yeah. yeah. it Two is not trips. real. No, enemies if, to if lovers. they if they can physically coexist, yeah. it's not enemies to lovers. Yeah. 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 Anyway, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, I think there's um, the there's there's a the moral ambiguity and, and the idea, when I went into the Atlas series, I knew that I was going to subvert what I felt was a, an unbelievable hero archetype. And I actually wanted to subvert what felt to me as a very unbelievable um, like heroine archetype. That there were lots of characters in fantasy and you know, it was great that we were seeing more women in fantasy, but I felt like we were seeing the same woman in fantasy right. and that she was making you know, good moral choices um, but not for any reason that made sense. Like that, that there was there was nothing about her background that suggested that she would that would be this way. Like why isn't she more neutral? Why isn't she a little bit more chaotic? Why is she so easily on board with the institution um, just because people tell you that it's good? And there was just something not very interesting about that. And so I wanted to take this idea of let's follow a corruption arc, but let's also look at what. I, um, with the Atlas series, I was playing a lot with scale, that when we enter the series, it's this kind of bottle episode of like, I want you to buy into this concept that like, only five out of these six people can survive. And, and that we're gonna, we're gonna live in this very pulpy environment. It's just the real full blown like, I, I call it the theater of academia, that mm -hmm. like when you're in academia, you become convinced that the work you're doing is so important. Mm -hmm. You're doing it, you know, for the academy so that like 10 other people will read it. <laughs> and, and you just completely <laughs> lose track of stakes. And that yes. was something that I purposely wanted to do in book one. It's just like all the stakes have gone away. Like suddenly limitless power is the point, mm -hmm. even though that's, that can't be true. That's, that's not an actual, like the world, you know, is not an idea. The world is not something that you that, that there are there are more there are more real consequences there is more important accountability there is such a thing as having a choice in any situation you know that the I wanted to kind of play with the idea of like oh I didn't have a choice I didn't have a choice I got on this road and I couldn't get off but like you always have a choice yeah. and um, so I think that was interesting for me uh, from a place of like 
looking at it from philosophy and psychology and and so I think just I I'm a I'm a thinky person I like thinky books mm -hmm. and so I think there is sort of a um, fantasy becoming like the other genres sort of crossing into it that we've got you know romanticy and there's sort of literary fantasy and um, technically the Atlas series is crossover sci-fi and fantasy and I think being able to have all those influences is evolving fantasy as a genre mm -hmm, where we can right. look at liter literary archetypes um, in a different way that it's not necessarily paint by numbers. Mm -hmm. So dark fantasy I feel like it has you know it, the the dark fantasy of the book selling days of the, the vampire days the werewolf days I mean that's traditionally been a space dominated by female authors mm -hmm. um, and but with you know female authors come female protagonists yes uh, as well as other identities you know that are marginalized by the dominant narratives um, people whose stories that you know are rarely told they can bring with them like a host of unpopular truths that we all find un may we all probably should find uncomfortable um, so we get you know books examining colonialism um, racial social sexual inequality and I wondered how much of these new perspectives and stories of, is fueling the growth and popularity of dark fantasy or what you know we've basically defined dark fantasy as what are these new voices bringing? You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, the interpretation of what is darkness, I think, is mm, very is yeah. a very interesting one. And, and like I said, kind of exploring the, the accountability within a sociopolitical system that is still very much like ours. So it's like, okay, we solved climate change, but actually, surprise, we only solved climate change for the Western world, um, which was something that felt very, that that was conceivable, that that would happen. That was like, okay, well, you know, the US and the UK, we're fine. Let's not worry about what's happening to the rest of the world. Um, so like I specifically chose to use a Filipino character and I am part Filipino um, because I, I just had a hunch. I was like, what country would be most affected by climate change? And like number one and number two is like, you know, it's, it's Japan and the Philippines. And um, so it's very easy then to build that in. And there were many, I was really trying to play with form. I really liked the idea of let's, let's, let's give you an idea and let's zoom out. Um, I compare it a lot to Westworld that like once you w watch more of it and see the rest of the world, it recontextualizes what you were introduced to in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, in this way, I tricked many people, I believe. Um, <laughs> Sorry, uh, and <laughs> um, like I mean, but what is that? I think there's a lot of different storytelling traditions that are being brought in. Um, someone pointed out to me that I, I follow a storytelling structure that is not the traditional five act, but is closer to like the East Asian three act, mm -hmm. um, which is like it's not necessarily something I'm thinking about because I'm not like necessarily trained in literature. <laughs> I'm not at all. Um, you don't admit. I that. just read books. <laughs> yeah, but but so these. I think these are just like the you know talking about form and talking about theme. I think the influences of other voices coming in is contributing to this sort of richer texture. That the way that you hear a story. I guess a, a really good example is. Um, uh, oh my goodness! I can see the cover. Strike the zither. That duology. The Joan Hay. Um, yeah. The the way that there's that that uh, break. I don't, I'm not spoiling it, I'm not spoiling it, the POV <laughs> shift, <laughs> that is not a spoiler. <laughs> um, like that, that's a really interesting method mm. of story, and, uh, but she's had to defend that choice many times. Um, and yeah. uh, I think that's like one of those things that the, the way that we experience story, it feels new and it feels dynamic because uh, we're, we're experiencing different storytelling um, form. Yeah, I, I was actually, um, you know, thinking about um, something that I see online a lot saying how like a certain genre or subgenre or whatever is like it's over, it's passe, it's yeah. done. <laughs> and um, you know, and it's it's not done until like you know the, the protagonists or, like you know until you get like gay romance in it or black protagonists or different other marginalized voices in it. And it feels really infuriating to me to declare like you know a certain trend to be over with without giving it over to other marginalized voices to um you know to explore and um you know and, and one of the things that I wanted to do in to gauge a god was put a you know was was really really center a sapphic love story um 
in, because one of my favorite uh, fairy tales, kind of like for you know fairy tale retellings when I was growing up, was Melinda Lowe's. Um, was it God Melinda? Her Cinderella retelling, which I'm going to, I'm forgetting at the moment. I can always see the cover. I can always is. see the cover. And like, can I just describe to you the font? Uh, oh, that yes, <laughs> yes, that one. And yeah. you know, and that one is a sapphic love story. And it just, mm -hmm. when I read it, it blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Melinda Lowe always blows my mind. She's an amazing, amazing author. And um, and so when I read it, I was just like, I have never read a fairy tale retelling that centered a sapphic love story. And I think it's really important to to you know to why when when you have when you're you know have these different experiences, people see more of themselves in these books. Mm -hmm. And they may not necessarily do that when the genre is so limited to like these to these like really heavily represented groups. And it's it's frustrating to me when when people tried to declare it over, like when vampire romance was basically declared over, and I was just like, well, I would have liked to see different perspectives. Right. Mm -hmm. in, in who declares yeah. it over anyway? Who declares yeah. it who over anyway? Who is this person? Anyway? Who no. is this person? <laughs> I, to your the point about the the more female characters as well, and then then there, I still feel that many feminine protagonists are very similar in. Uh, I guess like texture, um, and and so that's why like I I have had to make the choice now too that like I'm going to write more women into the story. Yeah. Sometimes it's like why are there so many men on the page? Mm -hmm. Why is this? Ha why have I done this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Why is this such a sausage fest? <laughs> yeah. Like I. And I but it, but it's interesting because it is it is an intentional choice. Mm -hmm. It's like sometimes you know sometimes you find a character and they just they are who they are and you know, from a craft perspective, that's just what's happening. But you could sit down and be like, you know what, why are there more men on the page right now? I have a, I have a book coming out in 2025, it's called Girl Dinner, and there are two men with speaking roles, and many women, it's a cannibal sorority. Um, <laughs> and and that, that was a conscious decision. And oh I'm my really god! So, <laughs> so actually, like um, one Ooh. of the one of the books that that I've written is Seven Devils, and I, I co-wrote that with um, with L. R. Lamb, and we have this entire large group of of women on this on the spacecraft, and one token dude, and it's the very um, Ghostbusters. Yes, but. and the, <laughs> and the amount of like weird I don't know like like weird responses to it, it was yeah. just really bizarre. Are. Like, you know, one person being like, yes, you know, this 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 space romp where the girls get the to have some fun. <laughs> the space romp. <laughs> yeah, the girl power space the romp. The girls get to have some fun. Were they specifically like, weirded out by the fact there were like not many men? Was that, oh, oh, was that of, it? It was like all of the men are are dumb. <laughs> like <laughs> There's, you know, it's like it's like it's, it's just a space opera with occasional lesbian snogging, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, actually it is. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> it, it is fun too to write. It's there's there's just a very interesting shift when you're writing a predominantly feminine space. Yeah. Um, I found that to be very interesting. Also, I, on a completely well, not completely different note, I I have a young adult book coming out, and with young adult. You get the unlikable female protagonist, like that is just thrown around all the time. And um, and why did I start talking about that? <laughs> what Lost a good question! What a good question, <laughs> Albie. Um, oh, and, um, it's it's funny to think. I think there are lots of people who are like, oh, well, everyone agrees that like we're we're not we're not sexist anymore. What is this? Two thousand six, you know. And um, but then but then you see the reviews and people are like, I just didn't like this girl for some reason. Yeah. Do you get that still? You know, and it's just like, yeah. 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 I'm not sexist, but oh yeah, I'm not sexist, but and then that also with with the with the um, with the idea of sapphic retellings that like those specifically are like, you know, I don't know why I don't like this. Could it be that there's two women on the page? <laughs> so anyway, that's just there's a fun thing. Much, there's that's just a fun feminine energy. Yeah, there's just something weird here. I just didn't like this character for some reason. I couldn't think of what it was. Um, but yeah, so that but it, it has been interesting, I think, to purposely yeah. decide like, oh, I'm gonna I'm going to shift the balance. There's going to be more women on the page and seeing the responses to that. Oh, oh my gosh, yes, no, it was, um, one, one response was, these women are planning so often. 
How dare they? And I'm like, damn, okay. <laughs> How dare they? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> well, speaking of sapphic love, yes, yes, we are. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to say it. We are going to talk a little bit about romanticy, but like why like are you it or well, you know, because some people loathe the term, and it is. I feel like it's a little bit divisive. I love it. You know, I so I, I always float it first to see when romanticy is go. just the Brangelina yeah. of you know, <laughs> it's just a portmanteau. It is. It's the Brangelina. I do. I do have theories about romanticy though because. Right. Well, because there's romantic fantasy, and right. then there's romanticy. Okay. And to me, I, wait, you were going to ask a question. I'm just going to keep talking no, no, about it because I no, started. I'm, this I, is the question. This is the question. So I'm really interested I, in this. I think that what, what romanticy is, is that it has to do with the pacing and versus the world. So if it's romantic fantasy, it is a fantasy pace story that has romance in it. Versus if it's romanticy, it's a romance pace story in a fantasy world. That's my thought. Agree or disagree? Agree. Of course you're not going to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, She's have... like, yeah. <laughs> I've actually spent a long time on that. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> we have Elizabeth, and Elizabeth writes romance. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you are in a uniquely qualified position to talk a little bit about how romance works in your books. I mean, what role does it serve in the wider framework of your work, like of your of your world? You know, if we're talking about romantic fantasy versus romanticy, we're talking about world building. Where does the emphasis fall in romanticy versus traditional fantasy? If you want? Yeah. So I would definitely say it's like with a romantic. Most people, it's like there's like some. Wait, confusion. so do you not like the term? Are you? I you, I you're love making a the face. term. <laughs> I love the term, but uh, but evidently there is some confusion as to whether or not the term is a combination of romantic fantasy or a combination of fantasy romance. Uh, um, and so, so people, that, can, that confuses that people. People have too people. much time. <laughs> and so, so for me, I'm just like, the romance is first in yeah, your word. Yeah. Um, and so, so I always kind of see it as it's 50-50. It's 50% it's 50. It's, it's 50 fantasy and it's 50% romance. It has to be heavily romance. And <laughs> I always get a bit frustrated when I see works that are described as romanticy and they're like 2% romance and like... Yeah, you know, ninety eight percent fantasy, and I'm like, that's just that's, it's a it's a romantic fantasy. It's that is a type. Rom, the romantic is describing the fantasy, right. whereas in fantasy romance, the fantasy is describing the romance. Um, so I've always seen it as you know, romance set in a secondary world that follows traditional romance conventions. Um, so that's that's the way that I've kind of always um, seen the terms. And um, so when I was writing Take Age of God, it was really important to me um, that the romance be given, um, you know, as much weight as the fantasy aspect. They and and I do think that there's it's an it's it's a bit of an interesting response because the romance and the fantasy take up a lot of of real estate in a book. Mm -hmm. um, combined they require a massive amount of effort because you are essentially creating you know people spend an entire book on a romance alone without any world building just in a normal you know when they're writing normal romance so when you're writing fantasy you fantasy romance you have to fulfill these, you know, the fantasy requirements right. on top of that. And that creates, it's a really, it's a, it's surprisingly difficult to no, balance. It, I think it sounds like a really difficult balance. Yeah. As, as somebody who writes, I, I'm the 2%. I, yes. I, I generally write more sort of the, the fantasy plot. And, and I, I, I like a romance in my book, it's but it's more never than 2%. A, yeah. Okay, well, but you yeah. both also, <laughs> you also spend a lot of times, you both have very like complex political systems. Yeah. And it was like, and then I was just like, you know what, what if, what if, what if I put, Two romances in this book. <laughs> what if I did that? And, and uh, it's very delicious. Everyone eats. <laughs> Speaking of delicious. Oh, they eat. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of delicious. <laughs> what is what is with the spice craze? Like, what is going on? What where did that come from? Like the fade to black is a thing of the past. And I say this 
quite a lot in a quite alarmed way personally because I have um, I've you know I've written many romance scenes I I fade to black and my newest book which is uh, about 48,000 words long at the moment um, like within that, I managed to put a hand job. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand what's happened to me. I'm not this kind of writer, but I am this kind of writer. Clearly, I've been inspired. Like, well, I think it's great to see I, it on the I page. Do, yeah. I do think that that you know, it's it's a lot of people, you know, really seeing like. You know, sex being done on page that is that it's plentiful, and you know, it's something that that like. Um, you know, that, that's become really popular, but it also creates a conversation mm -hmm. about different types of sexual relationships. You know, a lot of people, there are plenty of people who think that it's like unnecessary, but, you know, sex <laughs> in, you know, sex in, um, you know, like, eating. Tell me as a human being that sex or like the, the thinking about sex or the sex being present, like, or the choosing to or not to have sex, that that's yeah. not extremely relevant in your life. Like, that's just, I don't understand. Anyway, sorry, keep going. No, no, I, um, you know, it's just that, you know, it's, it's, it's appealing to a lot of people because you get to discuss different character dynamics and different kind of sexual dynamics, which I think, again, is, is, is always fascinating. Um, so in mine, it's like, since I've got like a bit of a villainy romance and then I've got the sapphic romance, they're very different sex-wise. One of them is very knife to throat, having sex well, knife to throat. Um, <laughs> and then the other is very, you know, softer and more r romantic. And I love, I love being able to like write about these different dynamics. Um, exploring romance and, and exploring sexual relationships, I think, are, are really interesting. Um, have you read Freya Mask? Because I think Freya's books, anyone, Freya Mask fan? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so Freya has this amazing ability um, to write quite graphic sex scenes full of emotion. And I think that's what I really love about her work and what really great sex scenes can do. They, they bring that emotion. If you can, if you can you know, show it on the page, but you, you have the emotion there as well. And it just lifts the characterization. I just think she's a genius. So I've learned a lot from reading her work. <laughs> I had a very fun, I, so I was going to say also that I do not write romanticy, I write slutty fantasy and that's different. <laughs> oh, another um, subgenre. <laughs> and so I recently had an event also with RF Kwong, which was amazing because she asked me to tell her how to write a sex scene in like 30 seconds. Which was a very interesting challenge because I decided to take it extremely seriously, like uncomfortably serious. Okay, yes. Yeah, I, I know was like, no, no, let's do this. I'm, I'm let's curious do this. now. And, and um, yeah, well, I, because in my opinion, it is not a good sex scene if there is not the emotional richness. Yeah. That like, what makes a good sex scene is not the extent to which you show it on the page, but the fact that something, like the stakes, you can't go back that because of the decisions you've made as part of the sex scene that you have like, what, what you have consented to is significant to the storylines. It now changes the characters' motivations. It changes the way they feel about each other, about the rest of the world. It changes their morality, perhaps. It changes the entire um, arc of the story. And that's how you know it's a good sex scene. And um, she was asking me this because she was like, so what? she's writing a romance right now, which is new territory for her. And she was like, well, my characters have, like, they've held hands. And I was like, listen, I wrote a scene in Alone with You in the Ether that is hand-holding, that is basically explicit sex on the page. Like, and, and it, it really is just about, like, uh, that something is irreversible in this moment, that we can't come back from it. And I think, like, I, there's a lot of, I, I have a, I just, you know, reflexively push back against a lot of this, like, censoring when it comes to sex. Like, I think it's very crazy that that the 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 idea of an unnecessary sex scene makes me very upset. <laughs> I'm like this is, this is I'm like this is for the people that appreciate the on page sex. Yeah, like well, like yeah, it's it, obviously, you know, it's not that you choose your reading experience, of course. Like there is such a you can have a squick and that's fine. Yeah. Um but you can never tell me that a sex scene I've written isn't necessary or that it doesn't need mm -hmm. to be there. It absolutely needs to be there. And so many like even, you know, even at the most emotional and passionate of times, sex is also about power. And it's about taking that power off the table, putting it on the table. You know, like it's it's a lot of times it's it's a form of manipulation in the Atlas series. Um, a and coping mechanism. Yeah, like yeah. what like sex is it's it's undeniably important. You can never just it's never just there for like, I don't know. Mm. 
what, like glitter on the page. Although if it were, I'm, I'm a proponent of glitter as well, so like fine. So my uh, challenge, my challenge recently actually was, I have not written a slow burn romance in like years and years, and so I just wrote a slow burn romance, and I like wanted to die. Um, <laughs> I know slow burn romance. And so my challenge was to write the sexiest slow burn romance that I possibly could, and like take them to this point where it's like slow burn, and like every touch is like significant, yes. and yes. every and, glance and is significant. Is like, it has and the like, of a sex scene. Yes, yes, and I'm like, if they are not eye fucking each other on the page, I have not done my job. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> this is a dark fantasy panel. We are using whatever words we like. I'm so uh, sorry. My, my, my co-author is out there somewhere probably saying, Elizabeth oh, made no. it. Like, how, wait, how, how far in are we <laughs> without swearing? 43 minutes. Oh, yeah. Usually I get it in five. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, I know it was my bad because I did ask about romanticity and I knew it was going to go down the sex road, but we've done it. We've, we've fulfilled we've expectations. It. Yeah. No, no, so. I'm so pleased with where we are, actually. I like the journey we've taken. So I'm happy with this too, but I, there's one more, well, there's several more things I'd like to ask you, but my favourite one, because I'm a massive nerd and I've just spent three and a half hours researching Celtic mythology and traditions in the British Library, um, I wanted to talk with you about like research, uh, the, the, the things that make it into your work, you know, the, a bit about the sort of things, the research you undertook, the, whether you had any texts or ideas in particular that deeply influenced your work, because, you know, I, yeah, I'm happiest when I'm, you know, digging in the most obscene rabbit hole. <laughs> like, in the back here, we've got my, um, which I, it's called related reading, because I was like, I didn't actually write down every book I read, because I didn't realize that I was researching. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't purposeful, like, well, I'm definitely going to put all of this in a book. But there is a list of books here, if you're interested in the things that I um, read about while I was working I on I asked the, the right question. Yeah, I knew, yeah, I knew. yeah. <laughs> so there, there's, there's some, you know, there's, there's John Stuart Mill in here, and Carlo Rovelli, my favorite favorite physicist. Carlo, I love you. Call me. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, that was definitely, I, I read a bunch of mythology. Uh, I wanted to, there's a whole thing where a character thinks they might be a god, and so I was doing some <laughs> sort of looking at like, like what I was, I had this theory about generations of gods, that you have the early generation of gods that they, you know, that are just like, the, they're kind of like the vengeful god that the have to do with the nature and stuff. And then from there you get arts and the drunk gods, the party gods. The party gods. Yeah, and like, like what if we were to keep going? <laughs> anyway, so there was, lots of, there was lots of mythology and psychology and philosophy. Um, but I also just have a, like, you know, I have the menti ills. And sometimes I just get very interested in things and don't realize their research. Been doing a lot of reading about jellyfish recently. <laughs> uh, it's gonna, you're gonna you'll see that on the page someday. Yeah. I won't tell you in what form. <laughs> they are really <laughs> fascinating and disgusting, though, so I kind of understand yeah. that. Yeah. Sort of and I, my background is in social sciences as well. So when actually when I was working on Girl Dinner, I was doing some deep dives into trad wives just to try and understand it. Um, and, <laughs> and did you come away understanding it? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I do think that it is, it is slightly uh, reassuring to know that the majority of people who are consuming trad wife content are um, men. Mm. Uh, yeah. Really? Okay, yeah. I did not know it's that. It's kind of porn, um, is what it is in terms of consumption. Um, but, but like, I wanted to come at it from a place of like, you know, okay, let's talk about traditional feminine roles and why they're appealing in this particular time. I, last year, we were going through such a... 2023, you know, the year of the girl, it was like coquette core and romantic academia and like linen dresses and, uh, you know, and it was just like, I, I, the, these, these cottage core vibes, this, oh, need to like, core, yeah. this need to escape capitalism, I understand. Like, I understand why you open the door to like, well, what if, what if I got to have traditional feminine roles and like, and, and kind of asking myself like, well, what is the problem with this other than mm. me just being a millennial girl boss mm -hmm. and being like, no, we got to be in the room at the table, you know, but like, but what if I took that reflex away yeah. and, and what does this really mean? And of course, like there is no one role, there is no one feminine role, there is no one um, female experience, but there is definitely some that takes power off the table. And so that was kind of the, the social 
thought exercise. Everything I do is thought exercise. It's great because you, you, you can't do any of you can't. The book is is so neat and contained, and you, right. nobody yeah. knows all of this stuff that goes behind I loved it. That. Yeah. It, it. It was a Tumblr post. I love you, Tumblr. Call me. <laughs> 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 that was like that. The you know, like a cross stitch. The book looks like a cross stitch, and then you turn it over, and you can see all the how things connect, and no one will ever know all those different pieces. And until the, you get asked, at yeah, the event, until you include it at the end <laughs> of the book. It all comes out. Yeah. What about you, Elizabeth? Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's uh, probably pretty apparent that I, you know, looked really deeply into the Russian Revolution. Um, I also looked very deeply into, like, pre-Russian Revolution, um, mid-1800s, when the serfdom was abolished and that sort of thing. And um, I actually did not come up with the story first. What happened was that I became really obsessed with this book called Nicholas and Alexandra by Robert Massey. <laughs> And I was reading this. I don't know why, for some reason, I was just like, you know, let's pick this up and, and see what I get from it because, um, because I really love, like, royal family drama. And I will read, like, it's the Roman my, Empire. that is my catnip. <laughs> I will read anything. Tudors, anything, as long as it's just this messed up royal family drama. Love it. Anyway, mm -hmm. so I picked up this book and I lost my mind. Um, I could not stop reading it. I was like, I have to, I can only read like 20 pages of this at a time because I feel like I am, like every time I read it, I just start screaming. <laughs> Everything about this family is so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, like it is like just you know terrible at everything how are you so bad at everything <laughs> and um and then I read his entire like body of work which he has has many books about the Romanovs and then like suddenly decided that I was like you know it's like I was gonna read more about the Romanovs and so just became like low-key a little Romanov expert and mm -hmm. um you know, and so then I was just like, okay, well, I really love, um, my background is actually in folklore. So yes. I, um, yes. <laughs> so I have an academic background in folklore. And so I was really interested in um, using Russian, um, Russian dragons in, um, you know, in, in the world, because I think they're, they're so different than like Western dragons um, and are, are, you know, a bit more, uh, they tend to be more tied to people. Mm -hmm. um, they come, they, they're more like shifters, but not necessarily shifters. They're like people who have like dragon qualities or like, you know, other sorts of things. And, um, and so I was just like, yep, let's put these two things together. My, my two pet interests, and um, so, yeah, that's how I, I kind of came up with, like, the basis for that world. And then the characters kind of came after that. Um, but, yeah, so basically it was, like, years of research into, into the Russian Revolution. And, uh, and then I wrote it, and then it was picked up, and then the war broke out. And I was just, like, so much of, oh. so much of imperial Russian history yeah. is just, uh, is, is just basically what's happening now mm -hmm. is, is Russian imperialism. Um, it's, it's, yeah, so that's, that's a, yeah. <laughs> in dialogue with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Every book comes from a place of like, here's a weird obsession I had. Yeah, yeah. I got, got really into bees and theoretical so, physics. So what I, what I have, <laughs> my, my nickname for that now is, this is my Titan submersible. Because, <laughs> because I just like low key became like obsessed with yeah, that for a while. Yeah, suddenly I'm an expert. And so, yeah, and so like, so like my husband will be like, what's your Titan submersible this month? Yeah. And, you know, and it's just like, yeah. well, <laughs> you know, this month it's cults. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> it's always cults. And then I buy like, and then I buy like so many books about like that subject. And then read them all, and I'm like, okay, and I'm done. <laughs> yes, and now, well, now finally the idea is born, and now I can write it down. Yes, yes. exactly. Well, we have a, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying it's miraculous because we could just sit here and talk for the next three hours, but we have man managed to fill 50 minutes. So I'm going to. We did it, team. Yeah, we did it. We did it. We, I want to obviously open the questions up to the audience, but before then, can you give us a little hint about what's next for you both? 
Mine is no. No? <laughs> okay. I'm shocked. <laughs> well, I've talked to you. Okay, what's your current... Okay, current, okay, yeah, so yeah. I can say... What's, what's your current submersible? Yeah, my current <laughs> submersible. Um, you know, I won't, give my, I, I won't give my current submersible. Oh. Um, but I will say <laughs> that my next project is another fantasy romance. Um, I have, oh God, like six, six of them. Um, so wow. many. Yeah. Do you work on multiple drafts at the same time? Of yeah. Things? Oh yeah. God. I have, okay. um, because I write under two different pen names. So it's like I write under Elizabeth May and I write under Katrina Kendrick for historical romance. And so last year it was like me working on like three different manuscripts on top of, on top of each other. How, how do you know which one you want to do on a certain day? Is that just a feel? You feel it. The gods call to you. <laughs> My editor messages too. me and says, this is due on this day. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> and that one is sooner than the other one. <laughs> so that's how I decide. I'm just like, okay, we're going to put, put a hold on this project and, and get, the, get this one out of the way. And so that, that's what happened. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, that's, that's a I can't, very I can't, understandable answer. <laughs> yeah, I can't write two. I can't write them like... Um, necessarily like at the same time like I have a friend who can do that and I'm just like I, I don't know how but um, I do use two different voices for my for my work because my historicals are, are yeah. very British and my Elizabeth May works are very not <laughs> so so those are it's pretty easy to switch between them well I talked a lot about girl dinner and that's actually the last one in the it's just the one that I have recently finished so I'm still I'm still in the the marinating Phase. <laughs> I couldn't eat meat for a while after I finished this book. Uh, I need a lot of salads. Um, so, okay, wait. Oh, what, what am I? Okay, so I have a young adult coming out. It's called Twelfth Night. That's in June. Question mark. It's in June. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, my anthology, Januarys, is coming out in October. Gifted and Talented is my next fantasy standalone. It's basically succession, but with magic. It's actually inspired by the Royal Tenenbaums. I keep describing it as like your friend who has ADHD and like is half a bottle of wine down is telling you the plot of succession. Um, and then Girl Dinner is after that one. Uh, and that's a satire. So yeah, I've got, I've, I've got a lot. I'll be here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Over to you lot. Does anyone have any questions? Hey, and you <laughs> Oh, I think there's a mic coming your way. Hi, um, so this is a question for both authors. So most authors say that they're introverts, but listening to you both speak tonight, you're both so articulate and you just seem so comfortable on the stage. Are you extroverts? How would you describe yourselves? I'm just curious. <laughs> I, I am an antisocial extrovert. I love strangers. Don't get to know me. <laughs> um, I am 100% an introvert and could probably just stay in my house, never interacting with a, another human being other than my husband for, oh, actually, I did it for years. So uh, <laughs> tonight is actually my first time, you know, doing an event since 2019. So. <laughs> Yes, I really appreciate that you say that because, yeah, I feel out of practice. <laughs> if it helps, we're performing. <laughs> these, these are not our real personalities. We've practiced them for you. Mine is a goblin with three cats. <laughs> so. We were actually told not to let her talk about her cats. <laughs> yeah, we were. <laughs> Can't talk about my cats for hours. <laughs> Get me going. <laughs> yeah, this is a performance that we're doing for you. Would you, would you like to weigh in? Well, you you did have a. We were just talking about how you did a like media performance for authors. I did. Yes. Well, I have a background in acting. I was a child actor. Um, so, <laughs> uh, my mother has a funny story about this. Apparently, one day I decided. I said, Mom, I don't really want to be an actor because. I can't deal with the rejection. I'm going to be a writer instead. Oh, God! <laughs> <laughs> Joke's on me. No, I actually decided not to be a musician based on not wanting a life of rejection. People always ask me, like, when did you decide to be a writer? And I always have to say, I didn't. Writing came for me in the night. Like, it's just, I don't, I don't want to do this. You. Yeah, like, I, <laughs> 
Unfortunately, I'm just bad at everything else. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely have that, like, I am uniquely suited to being a writer and, like, could literally, you know, hold down no other job. Just, yeah. Just based on the fact that, like, yeah, I, I could probably spend um, extended amounts of time in my house with my cats. Yeah. Well, so thank God you came to this, or, like, who knows, I'd have to do something else to do someone's, like, accounting. <laughs> Oh, wow, many, many questions. Okay. <laughs> someone, someone with a mic make this decision. Yep. You can, I mean, I, I, can, I can point and wave as much as, a, but, you know, the, I don't have the power. <laughs> Hi, ladies. Um, I'm going to, it's a question to all three of you, but I'm going to ground it in, Olivia, your acknowledgements in oh, the Atlas Complex. Yes, thank you. If, if that's okay. No, um, thank you for reading them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like my, it's my little, like, wonderful thing, reading the acknowledgements and getting a look into your psyche a little bit, which is <laughs> lovely. Um, <It's> welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so you spoke in your acknowledgements how the Atlas Six has really transformed as a product of mm -hmm. the world. Um, and just kind of the question in there is, you made some choices along the way that, did it kind of accidentally repeat itself and try not to give too much away in some character's journey intentionally throughout the whole time and you knew that was something you had to include in your third book or in your book? Um, and was, it, was there other decisions that you had in the beginning and then you kind of threw them away as you went along? Oh, I didn't plan any of this. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, definitely, I'm definitely a pantser and I, I love... Pantsers unite. <laughs> I love the discovery process. I mean, I, I basically, I like to joke that there are two different kinds of writing problems. That there's, there's the anxious writer, the writer who feels like they need to do a lot of pre-writing, who is really nervous that, like, they can't move forward because this thing isn't perfect. And that's not me. I'm the bored ADHD writer who's like, I will, like, if, if I already know the story, if I outline, if I do any pre-writing, then I no longer, then I know it. And then why am I here? Like, uh, like, uh, what am I doing? Just like, you know, lol catting on my computer. Uh, like, yeah. So I have to, I have to go in like relatively blind. And um, so I had, you know, as we were talking about, I, I had some idea of uh, archetypes that I wanted to subvert. Like I said, I really wanted to do a different kind of heroine, aka a heroine who wasn't one. Um, I also wanted to play with the idea of a very moral character whose morality was uh, kind of their weakness. That the they they weren't. Their morality was not fluid enough. It wasn't dynamic enough, so that they were um, allowing themselves to make bad choices because they were over rationalizing them. And so that, like things like that, were on purpose. How they actually fell apart, how things unraveled. That was a. That was a. Let's. We'll, we'll see when we get there. Um, but there were. The, that was. Oh man, writing a corruption arc is very fun. Um, and and I, I, I wish that people were paying more attention to the ways that the corruption was happening because um, it happened in lots of small ways first. That there, there was a, there's a character who was, um, she was weaponizing her victimhood in a way that was taking advantage of other characters. And, um, but it was one of those things where if you, got, if you got behind it as an empowerment arc, which is, you could view it that way, but there is such a thing... I'm like, how do I talk around this? <laughs> like, so basically, um, there is a character in the Atlas series who is an allegory for white feminism, um, for specifically for conservative feminism. And, and I had this idea of, like, what are you willing to break in order to maintain your personal view of the world? Like, how many other people are you willing to step on uh, mm -hmm. in order to get what you feel is your personal agency mm. and um, so it's very it's you know in that sense it's a criticism of girl boss feminism um, which I love to do I guess <laughs> um, and you know I guess it's just a kind of a how to how to exist as a person in the world also how to exist as a woman in the world um, and uh, yeah and, and I wanted to play with a character who was extremely fallible coming from a place of extreme morality and yeah, I don't know how universal this is gonna. Like, I'm like, at what point can I toss it to you? <laughs> um, sure. I mean, I, I kind of feel like uh, my well, yeah, because you did bring this up of like of being in a um, immoral position or being made to make immoral choices yeah. in order to preserve this more moral arc and purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know my books always kind of tend to explore how messy the monarchy is, and uh, it, like I, I I've noticed that just like fantasy always tends to include monarchy, and it's like in any of my books it's like they're bad, 
Well, you do a great <laughs> job of it not being a benevolent monarchy yeah. because I think so much of fantasy is like let's uphold. There's there's the good king, mm -hmm. and we're and and then in yours it's like no, <laughs> there's not a good king here. Yeah, yeah. But, I I always mm -hmm. I, I it's it's uh it's always something that's like. It's a, it's a fascination for me because I just think the monarchy is, is so messy. <laughs> I love mess. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so whenever I, um, you know, whenever I'm planning a book, it's like, how can I make this a messier and like, you know, talk about like, about how the monarchy is just like uniquely suited to create its own downfall inevitably. <laughs> And uh, that is that's how I come up with my with my arcs for for stories like these. Yeah, no, it's great, mm -hmm. and the the political structure is very very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Should we have a question from someone down the front? Oh no, you got you there. Okay, <laughs> go for it. Hi, thank you so much for your time this evening. It's so interesting hearing your your thoughts on the term dark fantasy. Um, my question is specifically for Olivia Blake, um, coming from a sort of fan fiction background. I was really curious about what the challenge was like of when you started writing the Atlas Complex and the challenge of now building your own world? Because I hear that both of you are saying you're very character driven, but what was that like to um, embark on that journey and how did you go about that process? Um, I think that that part for me wasn't very difficult because I was doing a lot of AUs, you know, as we say in the business. <laughs> um, that I, actually what pushed me out of fan fiction was people saying that like the worlds were now too different that I, I was basically writing like you know rom-coms and then I was writing political fantasies and people are like this isn't you know f uh, fan fiction is such a great safe place in a similar way to how romance is a nice safe place because yeah. you have an understand you know the tropes like they're listed for you up front you know like already what you're getting into and I was starting to tell stories where I didn't want the reader to know. And that's not like, I was breaking some really cardinal fan fiction rules and it kind of became like, oh, okay. So now it, it was more a question of who is this character? Is this character someone that I am dropping in another world but they already exist? Or is this a character that of my own invention that has their own motivations and their own backgrounds and stuff like that. What, it, what I think is so interesting about fan fiction as like a you know, literary study is, is the idea of like what do you keep? If you change a world, if you take the same character, it's, it's also an, an how, it's, it's how you interpret the character as well. Um, I have a lot of opinions about what makes certain characters that people disagree with. Um, I was like, do I want to talk about this? Not really, but let's say, so I, so I wrote Germione fan fiction for a very long time. At this point, I would say I'm conscientiously objecting um, from the source material. But to me, what makes Draco Malfoy is not the bullying, although that's obviously part of it, but the hesitation in a moment of um, moral crisis. And so when I am replicating him, that's what I'm replicating. But that's obviously a creative choice. And so it was kind of easy to transfer that sort of narrative decision making. What's hard going from fan fiction to um, a book is pacing. <laughs> Because in fan fiction, you can go off on a little side quest and like everyone will just follow you. Like if there's only one bed, everyone's cool with it. Um, and, and, and in a book, you actually have to like have direction. And my editor is like, so is there a timeline? Like, like what's happening narratively? Um, and and th the answer to can't we just vibe is no. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I, I think fan fiction is a great place, just like romance is a great place to learn characterization, uh, voice, what makes, what makes people care about a character, what makes people care about a relationship. Those are things you can learn really well from fan fiction. What you cannot learn is pacing, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and like form. Mm. Um, this is just a question for Elizabeth. Um, I'm sorry, um, I, I'm blind. So oh, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> um, I also have read Robert Massey. Have you read Catherine the Great by... I have. I think it's so interesting. Anyway, I just wanted to know I would recommend it if you haven't. Oh, yeah. Also crazy back then, too. So, 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 so good. Yeah. Everything that everything that he's written, like, I'm obsessed with. Do you yeah. watch The Great or did you watch The Great? Um, I, I didn't. Um, I keep you meaning should. to, but... Uh, yeah, it, it looks like like my kind of my kind of mess. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely a great mess. messy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Um, so you both said that your stories or like you take the approach of your books as being quite character driven and like that being the first and foremost part of it. And both the books have like such strong characters of varying different personalities. But how do you tackle it when a character is going to make a decision or action that doesn't necessarily agree with something that you personally would do? How do you go about writing that into something that sort of makes sense, like method acting as such, sort of like putting yourself in their position? <laughs> method acting. Just imagine myself being Callum Nova. <laughs> 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 it's but that's that's what's fun though is writing someone who is you would never do it like that I don't know that's the there, there's yeah. something just very freeing about that that's just like this is not a choice I would make this is a terrible choice one thing that, <laughs> one thing that often comes up in romance is like the things mm -hmm. that's sexy in a book is something that I would absolutely not tolerate in real life. <laughs> like, would I tolerate half the dialogue that happens, like, from, like, in a sex scene? No. <laughs> but, like, it's true. Busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it's just, like, it's it's a completely, like, kind of different situation. And I think um, one, of the, one of the things that I love about writing is being able to explore... Um, you know, explore all of these things that I, I really object to um, in fiction and just basically have my characters be extremely um, messy bastards. Um, love that about them. And uh, yeah, I want them to, I, I, it's a safe place for me to explore um, different kind of moral quandaries. And I'm, I'm kind of a, yeah, I love doing that. I almost never ask myself, what would I do in this situation? It yeah, would, it was not relevant. Yeah. yeah, it's not. Yeah, I'm not there. <laughs> if they asked my advice, it'd be a shorter book. <laughs> um, but yeah, and well, and and sometimes you know the the plot, the interesting plot, and the conflict comes from like how could, how could we make this worse? When I was going from book one to book two, it was like you know there there are scenarios in which all of these characters could be better. We could solve problems or we can make them much, much worse. Like I just combined two characters who should absolutely not talk to each other ever and, and just l see what happens. Um, and and that's, like, that's where the fun of the experience comes from, for me anyway. I, I, like, I like my books to have a pulpy quality. I like it to feel a little bit like you're binging The Bachelor or something, you know? <laughs> like while you're thinking about the ethics of the world also, let's, let's imagine. Who should make out in this scenario? Yeah, I love, I love, yes. yeah, I love a good pulp. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's what I write too. Yeah, <laughs> like wouldn't it be fun if they just just had a little kiss? Yeah, like basically, when when I am writing, I all I want is for people to read it and say, "Oh, the author had a good time writing this." I can tell. Yeah, you can you can really tell when the author is vibing. I've, people ask me all the time, like, who my favorite character is, and I think it's dangerous as an author to have a favorite character mm -hmm. because you can feel that on the page. The yeah. the energy shifts when someone is like, "Ah, oh, yes, my fave is here finally." <laughs> so I have to actively fight that. It's just like, no, I have to. If if this next character is not as interesting to me, then I have to make them more interesting. How much trauma can I give them? <laughs> Mine is always just like, you know, they're too comfortable. I want them to make, like, I want, I want something bad to happen to them now. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a real... This is too happy right now. <laughs> something terrible needs to occur. So I have Somebody a needs to die. creator god. <laughs> I have a cute anecdote about this. Um, does anyone, does anyone when, when they were kids, did they read Robin Jarvis? Deptford Mice series? No. Yeah, Deptford Histories. Okay, so I read these books when I was about 13 or 14, and in the Deptford Histories, there's a book called The Oaken Throne, which left me physically and mentally scarred for life. Um, because it's brilliant, but it's also horrendously sad. And it, the sadness comes on almost like the last page, and you're absolutely convinced that it's okay, and then he pulls the rug out. And anyway, about 10 years ago, I actually got to meet him, which was amazing. And I was like, oh my God, Robin Jarvis, you're like, you know, a childhood fave. But I have to tell you to your face, why did you do that? Why did you, why did you do that in the Oaken Throne? And he looked at me and said, well, it was getting a bit too close to a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> It's like I'm a romance writer, so for me, you know, happy endings kind of like tend to be my like natural progression. But I'm like, how about I make them hurt 
before then. So it's just, it just yeah, I, I need me of them that. to yeah. be tormented and go through like at, like seven or at least all nine circles of hell yeah. before I let them be happy. Certainly at least three. <laughs> at least three. <laughs> like, but preferably all of them. Well, I, you know, I mean, that's the thing. Dragged is, through it. A book that really stays with you is something that makes you feel something. You know, it, it something can be immaculately plotted and that you're not going to remember any of it. You're going to remember how, how you got a Attached to something or how you felt about a story or about a moment and uh, like that's you know that's the, the real humanity of the mm -hmm. book and that's what's interesting and <clears throat> it involves bad choices yeah. and sometimes <laughs> heartbreaking tragedies yeah yes <laughs> yeah sometimes yeah I actually um I, I think I lean on what I see as the structure of a Shakespearean tragedy kind of a lot that's like there that this could have been prevented you know that mm -hmm. that feeling of like oh yeah. if this thing had happened if if they had just talked to each other, oh. then maybe maybe we wouldn't have the yes. sword and the poison. <laughs> um, uh, but there, but there's still something sort of I don't know. There, it's it's almost a trope in itself, I guess. That this idea of like ah the the theater of tragedy that's happening here. Um, the the fact that it could have been prevented is kind of an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. okay. How much time do we have? Do we have time for more questions? Yes. Yes. I think so. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we need Mike to go along. I feel like the poor people in the middle get like deprioritized <laughs> just from being in the middle. Um, so this is an offer for uh, sorry, a question for all of you. Um, when you're writing, how do you keep all the ideas in your head just like there? How do you make it all come out into a book? Mental wow. illness. Didn't we answer this? <laughs> <laughs> My God, what a question. Um, I think the answer is you don't keep it all in your head all at once because it's not quite possible to do it. Um, it's, I was saying to my friend that you know, I, I live 90% of my life in my story, that the, the one that I'm writing at the moment, um, it's, it's kind of nice to be, to be here in the real world because I actually, you know, I love, I, I, otherwise I, I wake up thinking about my characters, I go to bed thinking about my characters, which is kind of sad but also sort of, you know, unavoidable um, when you're writing for a living. Um, and there's so much to remember. There's so many bits of history I want to get in. There's so many subplots that I want to explore. Um, I am, like, well, I was saying go pantsers. That's the type of writer I am. I have a, I have a chaotic document, which is called Notes. That's, that's it. Um, I have a notes document for my every notes document single one of my books. Crazy. My just my note, like my in the notes app, like it, just unintelligible stuff. I um, do have it on my phone as well. There is a notes document yeah. in case for midnight, midnight. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, just got out of something. the shower, just writing stuff. <laughs> the shower always has words in, the in any order. Yeah. This is what I mean when like writing just comes for you, like. I, c I could be doing anything else. <laughs> it does, it does come to you. Um, so I, I feel like there's not a really nice, neat answer to this question because it, it's, you know, if I think about something, you know, like I'll be writing one scene and then a snippet of conversation, like a snippet of dialogue from a scene that's going to be 100 pages in the future will come into my head and I'll just need to stop, open the notes document, put that dialogue down, save it for when I get to it. And it's, it's got to the point where I've actually got like these you know, five or six different scenes that I can't wait to get to, but I'm not at them yet. They're like little treats. They, they are, are little treats. treats. They're treats. Well, I, okay, I will say Practical advice, you have to practice ending. I mean, you have to, you have to think of writing whatever form you're writing in as like, a, you know, a marathon or a, a 5K or whatever. Like, you, it's not going to, it's going to be hard until you've done it. And then once you've done it once, you can do it again. And every, and your first draft is not the book. So you this just. This is important. <laughs> yeah, you just have to get to the end. You just have to tell the story to yourself, especially if you're a pantser and you have no idea what the story is. Then you get to the end and you're like, oh, that's what the book was. Yeah. And then with that knowledge in mind, yes. go back and then you have many, many more drafts to tell the story in a way that other people can understand. And it's, you, can't, you can treat it in a, in a method, met, met, methodological Methodology. Method 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 something. Methodology. Methodical. 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 Yeah. I will say. I will say though, it's like it, it's like you definitely like it's like practice. Yes, but I feel like every single time I start a new book, I'm like, wait, how do I write again? 
Oh no, yeah. How do I do this? There was actually always don't that terror how. at the beginning when you're looking at the blank page and you're like, okay, I've just finished a 140,000 word book and now I'm going to write another one. How does what one, did we do? How does one sentence, how does one write paragraphs and pages to create things? I just, I'm good up until like the, like the first act, like 20, 30K, and then I'm like, uh-oh, right. I'm not good at this. There's a plateau. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, 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 a plateau. A, there's like, uh-oh, I'm not good at yeah. this. I'm going to keep writing anyway. Oh no, it's terrible. I actually, I have people in my life who, will tell me like that's what you said last time and I'm like no 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 I mean it and they're like no 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 you said literally this word for word people have started sending me screenshots of like I say the exact same thing every time like I can't do this I can't write the book doesn't exist like it, do it doesn't make any sense I don't know what's happening so like that's a normal feeling you definitely mm -hmm. also experience some kind of temporary amnesia where every single book that you write is like yeah it's like I forgot how I did that it's <laughs> a partial fugue state for sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, that probably doesn't answer your question. God, I'm so sorry. There, there is no such thing as, as a method that works every time, though. Every book no. is different. And, and keeping track of everything is like, you, you kind of don't have to, though, because you have so many, you could just go back and fix it, is the thing. Like, oh, you forgot something? Oh, you changed the character's name partway through? It's cool. Like, yeah, you can I've, fix definitely, it. I've definitely done that find and replace. Yeah, you use that, use that quite a bit. Done fine and <laughs> Everyone yeah, has, or like, everyone's done a bad find and replace too. <laughs> everyone does find and then realizes they've used the word looks at or meets their eyes about 50,000 times. And okay. then you're like, okay, I <laughs> yeah, are, yeah. I, what, How do you know my text? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the editor was like, this character's been doing a lot of breathing. Like, yeah. okay. Okay, <laughs> 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 I uh, mean, it's like a, you, they needed to live, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and one of my books, I was like, oh, there was a dog at the beginning of this book. I just forgot. You know, like, <laughs> uh, the, like there is, there's no, yeah, there's, there, there are definitely some authors who are very, um, who have a very good methodology. Tracy Dion is, a, is an example of an author who works with, like, she has a lot of consultants. She's very organized. Um, I'm not like that. Uh, uh, not into it. Yeah. No. no, that would bore me. Yeah, this is what I mean. This is the, the anxious and the bored. Those are the only two. You you pick one, and you're one of them. Okay. Okay. Right at the back. Hi. Uh, thank you for your time. It's been fantastic. Um, this one's for Elizabeth specifically. Um, I know you've written a couple of books with a collaborator or you've co-written with someone else. Um, what's that process? <laughs> Um, Interesting question. Yeah, yeah. What is that like? <laughs> but I mean, um, not, was, you're, actually, you're like accountable to someone else. How, like, do you have to meet together and write together? Do you write a bit, send it off, critique each other? How does um, yeah, there is definitely, uh, there was definitely some some kind of in-person uh, time that we had to spend together because um, we tended to, um, to to bounce ideas off each other much better in person, and then we could like then incorporate those ideas into the document. Um, we we did it. Uh, we did try to like take the lead on certain characters, um, and then would write over each other. So um, L would take the lead on like uh, you know like two characters. Well, we had like seven POVs in in that series. So L would take the lead on like two characters. I would take the lead on two characters, and then we'd share. Um, we'd share the rest basically and like just alternate chapters. So there was a lot of alternating of chapters and then a lot of writing over each other. Um, but basically it was like, that is probably a situation where I had to, we had to learn how to outline a book because you cannot co-write unless you have some kind of solid plan. I don't plan. think you could co-pants. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> yeah, you cannot co-pants. You have to like have like a solid outline. And in our case, we actually had to develop like chapter by chapter outlines. So then we knew what each other was doing and how like the story would develop and the, you know, the the different themes that we wanted each character to have and that sort of thing. And it's it's a really difficult kind of process. There's a lot of, um, there's a learning curve um, because, you know, people might just have different um, writing schedules. I was really, at the time, kind of like a feast or famine writer. And Elle was very, like, kind of small amounts every day. So Elle would, like, work on the... the um, would work on the document for like a month straight and like see nothing from me. And then all of a sudden I would finish all of my work in like a week. 
<laughs> and like, I, you know, like an intense hyper focus. I don't work like that anymore. Um, but yeah, so it was just, it's, it's kind of in, um, it, it was really, it really forces you to, to be a planner. And for some people, I, I can see why co-writing situations may not work out because that is a very, very difficult thing to become if, if it's not your instinct. Um, but I loved working with Elle. Um, I learned so much from them. And yeah, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, but it's, it, it was so fulfilling. And I don't think we could have, I don't think I could have written that, either of those books myself, yeah. So, wonderful experience. How do you get the tone to match up between mm -hmm. chapters? The tone, you know, I think we were just, we just meshed very well. Um, when we wrote over each other, we, we have, I think each of us had different strengths when it came to our writing. So L was really, really, really good at like description, like these beautiful, beautiful descriptions. And I tended to kind of take over like the banter, um, interactions and that sort of thing. And then we both really like, I don't know, mesh well with the emotional beats. And um, so it was just a matter, like, like sometimes Elle would produce a chapter that obviously would not sound like me. And then I would just go in and, and basically overlay my voice from, from hers. So there was a lot of writing and rewriting um, each other's work. And you know, it's, it's, I could see why it's, it's, it can be difficult for some people because you can't be precious in that situation. Yeah, I just, if, right. just yeah, thinking, it, God, like, this is my because, hell. Like, like, yeah, because if like, someone touched my sentence exactly, that I wrote, exactly. I'd be like, no, so there get were, out of there my were house. Definitely, there were definitely situations where I would delete something Elle had written or they would delete something I had written, and it was like, wait, no, I liked that line explain yourself yeah. and we would have to like Zacuse. yes yes and so there would have to be like a process of like negotiation is the is the line necessary maybe it's not the line i'm reacting to but the way that it's written mm -hmm. and it's and so then there would be like a discussion about it and then it would be like okay i actually that line could be could be erased i, I see your point <laughs> but yeah so it's like it's like you can't be you can't be precious about about co-writing <laughs> Ugh, I'm so like tense from that. Yeah. <laughs> oh God! I, every time, every time I tell somebody about that, like one of my one of my friends was just like, "You mean they would delete a line that you wrote?" <laughs> and I was just like, "Yeah, it's fine." <laughs> yeah, one more. One more. One more. Oh, I don't. We're down the front here. <laughs> Let's say, where's the mic? <laughs> Um, out of all the books you've ever written, what was the most enjoyable, either book or character, to write for any of you? Oh, God. I, I'm always having fun. I'm having a blast all the time. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I think that the next one is always the best one. I, I, I think I, I like to look at myself as my collective works. I, people ask me all the time, do I have a favorite book? And I don't. Like, everything that's in the rear view is in the rear view. And, like, let's, I'm still working on these other things and working with new ideas. I've got a new submersible now, you know. Um, so I, I, always, I always look fondly on books. I look fondly on characters. But it's also like, but let me tell you about what I'm doing now. Yeah, that is a thing. That's totally a yeah. thing. I mean, I would have said, you know, like I really, in, Sister Song is, yeah, I really enjoyed writing that book. It was just, it hit at the right time. You know, the idea came, it meshed, everything was great. And I'm sure that if I said that to my sister, she'd be like, oh no, you were awful while you were writing it. You were awful. Um, Compared to Huntress, which is coming out soon, that was a much harder book to write. I think it's because I didn't have such a clear vision. So it's, I kind of want to be like, oh, you know, I enjoyed writing this book more. There are great characters in it. But now that I'm on the other side of the process, I've come out of the blood, sweat and tears stage, yeah. uh, which lasted a long time. Um, that book took three years to write. Um, you know, I'd be saying like, some of that storyline was, you know, the most interesting for me to write. Um, it's really hard. I can say it's really hard to pick a favorite character because I guess, you know, they are all parts of you. They have to yes, be. Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose you feel maybe a bit closer to one or another, but it depends. It, it changes throughout the book, you know. In the beginning, you feel closer to this particular one, and actually, once you've gone on the journey, maybe your paths have diverged a bit. So it is hard to say because, like you, I'd be like, no, I want to talk about the book I'm writing right now that 
nobody yeah. has seen and nobody will see yes. <laughs> for years. Which I already did several times. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's because you're, you're never the version you were when you wrote the book ever again. No. So it's, yeah, so it's just, I'm, it's always like reflecting on a past me rather than reflecting on a, a, a character. You've put it beautifully. Yeah, by the, yeah. Time, um, by the time the book comes out, it's like been years. Right. Yes. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. yeah, it's like I wrote to Cage of God like, God, when did I start writing it? Jesus. Um... 2015 and oh I yeah. <laughs> yeah. that was a long time it ago, was a long time ago. <laughs> um and uh you know in, in like it went on submission in 2019 2019-ish so yeah so it's like it's been years I don't actually remember it yeah. <laughs> and now you have to come to an event and talk about it. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is that book? <laughs> it's, it's a learning experience for me too. <laughs> I also find that I have different, like what I think a book is, is different from what other people think a book mm. is. Mm. I think the Atlas Complex has like a more uplifting ending than other people do. <laughs> <laughs> I like how people are like laughing. <laughs> Steven agrees with me that it's a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know that I have favorite characters, but I will say that I have certain um, characters' interactions that are my favorite. Like when two Jeans. characters, yeah, when two mm -hmm. characters like get together and they're just like ridiculous to, with each yeah. other. I, I that's my favorite thing is writing character dynamics. So I don't have I don't have favorite characters. I have favorite character dynamics. Yeah, and those are always fun. There yeah. are also definitely some moments that. Um, like after you go through millions of edits and some scenes are just so good the way you wrote them that they mm -hmm. never change and you always sort of feel strongly about those. The Aldo and Regan hand-holding scene in Alone With You in the Ether. Um, the Callum and Parisa misery waltz from the Atlas Six. <laughs> those, those are scenes that like just never really changed because they came from this sort of you know meditative state. And so you, you can never call that like a favorite thing, but it, it's... So, you know, something about it was so instantly important that they never, yeah, that they just lived that way. Yeah. I think that's a really lovely place to wrap up, you know, mm -hmm. on a meditative scene yeah. that, is, that, that, that transcends book writing and publishing. Yes. And it continues into the years. So. Yes. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank um, you. This is a wonderful it conversation. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.